Hello, welcome to the Way of the Wayfarer. Today, we are talking about a thought, a doctrine, an idea, whatever you want to call it, that I think that we all agree with and we all understand it, and yet is an area of our lives that we don't often live by. And what I'm talking about is faith. Now, one of the things that I don't need to do in this episode is define faith because the Bible in Hebrews 11.1 1, gives us a very simple and yet profound definition of what faith is supposed to be. And it simply says that faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you don't see. Now, again, that is a very simple and profound definition of faith, but that's not really what I want to talk about today. Because really what matters isn't necessarily what faith means as much as what it looks like. And to really talk about this, let me give you a scenario because I feel like the life of faith, the practice of faith, is like somebody walking up to the edge of a cliff and looking into the dark abyss, being ready to jump in some way somehow knowing that everything is going to be okay. Now, to, to sort of further this thought, I want you to think about this particular scenario from two perspectives. One, from the personal perspective, in that you are the person walking to the edge of this particular cliff and looking into the darkness and being ready to jump, knowing that everything's going to be okay. I don't care who you are. That scenario is scary. Like, there's no way that you are going to walk up to the edge of this cliff and not uh, walk up to it with a certain degree of hesitation. We're all going to have a little like, hey, is this a really good idea? Now, to further that, I want you to now think about the same scenario, but from the third person. Like, you are somebody observing someone else walking to the edge of this cliff being ready to jump, and somehow you're wondering, what is this person doing? If you were to observe this, you would think that this person is reckless, irresponsible, that they're engaging in dangerous behavior. Like, you wouldn't necessarily think, like, oh, yeah, this person walking up to this cliff, seeming to be ready to jump, this is a great idea. Most of us wouldn't think that. And see, this thought is really what I want to talk about today, because when it comes to faith, it is not us understanding what faith is that is the problem. It, uh, it is us actually living out faith, like having lives of faith. And this, if you really think about it, is even the case for a lot of the passages that we, uh, in the Bible, that we would think that are actions of faithful people, that outside of a Bible context and outside of even knowing the result, you wouldn't think that it would be a great idea. One of the ones that always comes to mind is when the Israelites are finally in Canaan and they're conquering the land, uh, one of the cities that they have to conquer is Jericho. And the plan that God gives them for this particular conquest is to basically walk around the city blowing trumpets. And I've often thought about, like, if I'm a soldier in Jericho, like the guys that are going to fight against the Israelites, and I'm observing this, I'm definitely going to think that I'm going to win. Because in as far as military strategies, walking around walls, blowing trumpets, doesn't in any other scenario guarantee you victory. And somehow the Israelites had enough faith to hear this plan and be like, we're going to do it. Another one, obviously, and one that, that always comes to mind for a lot of us is Peter walking on water, or actually Jesus walking on water, and then Peter being super gun ho about trying to do the same thing, and he takes a few steps out of the boat and then sinks. But again, nothing about walking on water seems normal, natural. It is totally an act of faith. And even though Peter takes a few steps that uh, work, Eventually, he sinks into the water because he's lacking faith. But I think any of us, given that scenario, wouldn't look at water in a storm and go like, oh, yeah, this is definitely going to work. And see, here's the thing. It certainly seems, and in many ways, one of the things that the Bible teaches about faith is that God requires it 
to do amazing things. And uh, I did want to sort of touch on that idea here in a second. But before that, I want you to think about the alternative. Because as you're listening to this, and you may be listening it to just alone in your room, or maybe you're driving, maybe you're sitting at work, or you're studying, or whatever, whatever it is that you're doing, many of us, a great number of us, uh, have had thoughts and dreams that we have not gone after, if we're honest, because of the fact that performing and going after those things is either scary or because we care about that third person looking at us going, well, that's not really smart. And this is what I mean. Maybe uh, you have a very good job. And for example, you've had dreams to quit your job and go serve the poor somewhere or go into ministry Maybe you're a student and you're like, I don't know, a sophomore or a junior, and you've thought about maybe taking a year off and going to serve the poor somewhere. Or maybe, I don't know, you have a dream to do some kind of great ministry work or something. And oftentimes, doing those things is scary enough. But I add on top of it that maybe some of us have approached other people, not bad people, people we respect and people we care about, about these dreams and ideas that we have, and the feedback hasn't been necessarily great. Maybe you approach your uh, one of your mentors or a sibling or one of your parents, and they've looked at you and been like, you know what, I don't think that's the wisest idea, or I don't think that's going to work, or basically any kind of thing that stops you in your tracks and stops you from doing this great idea, this calling that you feel that God is calling you to. Now, let me say this, because I think, A, that it's really sad if we think about all of the things that we haven't done, that we have not given the opportunity for God to act in our lives and do because we've been scared of doing them or because uh, we have been stopped by the opinion of someone else. Now, let me very, be very clear about this. I'm not saying that we should completely disregard advice. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't ask for people's advice. And I'm not saying that we should just blow off what other people think. What I am saying is that very few scenarios exist that require faith in which all of the conditions are going to be there for us to feel great about pursuing this one thing. Because the things that require faith are going to be scary and they're going to be things that a lot of times people don't necessarily agree with. Again, uh, let me even give you this example that I think that we don't often consider very much. And uh, this has to do with the story of Jesus and his parents. Right. And if you're familiar with the story of Jesus, basically, uh, Mary and Joseph are his parents. And well, let me just read it. This is in Matthew one in verse one. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And so I want you to think about this for a second, because I think, uh, just to give you a couple of things for consideration here. Uh, Jewish culture was basically a culture of what's called honor and shame. And honor was a super important thing. 
And one of the ways in which you dishonored yourself is by having a baby out of wedlock. And so what's happening to Mary is really scandalous, right? Like, she, great humiliation, and Joseph is aware of this, great humiliation could come upon her, right? Because she basically got pregnant before she was married. And so there's that aspect of it. But the, the other aspect of it is that Joseph was basically told that this was going to be okay because he had a dream. Like, in his sleep, an angel came and talked to him about this. And I want you to think about Joseph's uh, family here for a second because when this happened, probably his parents' first reaction was to be like, you need to let that lady go. And again, Joseph seemed to want to do that. But then I want you to think of after he has this dream to go back to his parents or to his family and say, like, listen, I'm going to go ahead with this wedding because an angel of the Lord came and talked to me in my sleep and said that this woman was having a baby by the Holy Spirit. If you're hearing that, I don't think that you're necessarily all into that idea. Especially since this had never happened before. Like, it's not like anywhere else in the Bible, right? There was any other instance in which somebody became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And yet, Joseph is so sure of this dream that he basically goes ahead. And we know that uh, he, he and Mary get married. And those are Jesus' parents. But to actually sort of obey that dream that he had to go after that dream and continue with his wedding required a lot of faith. It required probably for a lot of people to look at them sideways. And even uh, in, in, one of, in a scripture in Mark, which I can't remember right now, but in a scripture in Mark, it even says that uh, one of the ways in which they address Jesus is as the son of Mary, which was basically a way, a very uh, disrespectful way to address Jesus, and that basically what they were insinuating is that he was born out of wedlock. And so, again, this idea, right, of, of sort of this dishonorable this birth is something that follows Jesus and his family for the rest of time, if you will. But Joseph went ahead with it for no other reason that he had faith that this voice he heard in a dream was coming from, from God. And that takes a lot. That would take a lot today, but especially back then in that culture, it would have taken a lot. And you can do that, right? You can do sort of that analysis with any act of faith that you see in the Bible. All of them were challenging either because they were just by nature scary or because people wouldn't necessarily agree with them because it wouldn't go against convention, it would go against what would seem the simplest, it would go against what most people would agree would be the right course to take. And again, I'm not saying that any of the people in your life don't have your best interest in, in mind, I'm not saying to just blow them off, but I am saying that if we are going to do anything in faith, I can guarantee you that two things are gonna happen. A, it's going to be super scary, and B, there are going to be people that don't agree with what you're doing. That is the nature of faith. That is just how it is. And I think we need to make ourselves comfortable with that idea. That is a life of faith. That is how it's supposed to work. Faith, again, is like walking up to a cliff and looking into the darkness and being willing to jump and somehow know that it is going to be okay. And again, we understand the idea of faith, but many times we're really scary. We're really, but many times we're really scared to do faith, to live by faith. And I want to leave you with this. If you, if uh, in Hebrews 11, let me turn there really quick. Because, again, Hebrews 11, 1 has a definition of faith. But then it goes on to talk about all these people that basically lived lives of faith. All right? And it says, uh, uh, I'll start in verse 1. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, 
the conviction of things not seen, for by it people of old received their, com their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, the which he was con commended as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an, an heir and the righteous in the in an heir of, of the righteousness that comes by faith. And this chapter goes on and on to talk about people of faith and what they did by faith. And again, even when they mention Noah or Cain or any of these guys, part of what they mention is that the conditions were sort of set against them for them to do what they did, but they sort of proceeded with faith. And one of the things that I find really compelling here is that it says that in order for us to please God, we need faith. We have to believe that he exists, and we have to believe, and this is the part that's super interesting to me. It says, uh, uh, for whoever would draw near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And see, here's the thing. Many of these big dreams that we have, many of these big ideas that we have, the reality is part of the reason why they're scary is because they seem really unsurmountable. They seem almost like impossible things to do. But we do them because, in a sense, we feel like we're being called by God to do them. And to answer God's call is something that pleases him. It is something that he wants us to do. And we have to believe that by seeking God's will, that by maybe doing what God is calling us to do, right, that we're doing his work and that he is going to reward us for it. That takes faith. To jump into the big dark hole takes faith. All I'm getting at is that maybe as you're listening to this, you've had a dream of something big or something not so big something that just seems difficult, that you know that you need to do, that you feel like God has equipped you and made you capable, and maybe it's just maybe you don't have the capability, but you certainly have the passion to do it. And all I'm going to tell you is that if we're going to live lives of faith, we're going to have to have to go after those things. Because otherwise, we're living lives of fear and not of faith. If we're going to stop ourselves from doing what we think God is calling us to do, and we're going to stop doing them because we're either afraid or because we're afraid of what people think or because we've just been swayed by what others think, then that's not living a life of faith. And again, I'm not saying that maybe the advice of something being unwise isn't true. But I also want you to think about the many things in the Bible, right, that were done by faith that may not have seemed like the wisest. If you're Joseph's parents or any member of his family, to hear him say, like, I'm going to marry this woman anyway, wouldn't have been the wisest. Like, if you were advising him, what you would have told them is like, hey, Joseph, this may not be the wisest idea. Peter walking on water for sure, you could tell them this is not the wisest idea. If you're looking at the Israelite army just running around the city, blowing on trumpets, you could certainly tell them that that wasn't the wisest idea. You could look at David facing a giant and say, hey, David, this is not a wise idea. 
And again, I'm not I'm not saying blow wisdom off. Wisdom has its place. And certainly wisdom is important and people's advice is important. But what I'm telling you is that there is a time though in which we have to consider sometimes we need to go against people's opinion even if it is wise. Again, a lot of the acts of faith that were performed in the Bible, you could have totally said that they were bad ideas. And a lot of times, we need to engage with those ideas, again, not with necessarily the idea in mind, but because we're keeping God in mind. Because I'm not even sitting here saying that all of your ideas are going to be good. Maybe you do quit your job, or you go do this thing or that thing, and it was a terrible idea. But even what I would say in that scenario is that you have to believe that God has your back, even if that were the case. Again, we have to live lives that reflect our understanding that when we do what God wants us to do, some way, somehow, he's going to have our backs. With all that being said, let me finish with this thought, because I think this is a, a, a good distinction to make. And that is that there's a difference between danger and risk. And I think in the life of faith, this is something that we need to be aware of. And let me, for example, give you uh, the example of climbing mountains, for example. Climbing uh, big things is uh, dangerous, right? If you fall, you will die. But people that do this, right, most of the time they are trained they have equipment, they have ropes, they have carabiners, they have that white powder for their hands, all of this stuff. And in that sense, climbing a mountain with the right skills and with the right equipment, and maybe you have a guide, and maybe, again, probably most importantly, a rope, that is the difference between risk and danger. There are dangerous things that we engage with irresponsibly, like, again, climbing a mountain with no equipment, that's dangerous. Climbing a mountain with the right equipment, that's risk. And all I'm saying is that the difference is basically having a certain degree of a safety net. But see, here's the thing. If we believe that God cares about us, and we believe that there are great things that God wants us to do, right, then that ought to be our safety net. That is our rope. And so when we engage in these kinds of things, when we have these dreams, when we have these things that we feel that God is calling us to, we need to ask ourselves, is this risky or is this dangerous? And if we believe that God has our back, it is risky and not dangerous. And I think even looking at it that way is wise. And so let me be very clear because I'm not saying that all of us need to go out there and just do irresponsible things. But there are many of us that have dreams and that have ideas for better church, better ministry, to reach out to people, to serve the poor, to do something in our communities. And so many times we are stopped in our tracks because we're either scared or because we got advice and the advice wasn't very receptive. And all I'm saying is that the life of faith looks at that fear and sometimes even the opinion of others and we carry on believing that we're taking a risk that God, the creator of the world, is involved with. And again, I'm not going to sit here and say that every single one of our dreams and every single one of our intentions are good, but I'm saying that even if they're not, God still has our back. So if you have a thought, and if you have an idea, a dream, a calling, all I'm saying is that stop being afraid and stop caring so much about what other people think and go do it in faith. Go live the life of faith.